Network. Hey everybody, welcome again to Call to Communion on this Friday afternoon here on EWTN. It is the program for our non-Catholic brothers and sisters. If you've got a question about the Catholic faith, uh, particularly if uh, maybe you're a brand new Catholic, maybe you came into the church on... If you're listening to us in Zanzibar, please dial 1 and then 205-271-2985. You can always send us an email. The address for that, ctc at ewtn.com. Charles Beery is our producer. Matt Kabinsky is our phone screener normally. However, I believe uh, Ace is handling that today, Ace McKay. And uh, we also have Rich Jesse handling social media for us. So if you want to ask a question via YouTube or Facebook, just put that question in the comments box, and then uh, we'll get that. We'll hopefully answer your question on today's program. Again, the phone number, 833-288-EWTN. I'm Tom Price, along with... Dr. David Anders. Tom, how are you today? Very well. Easter is uh, still happening. It's still a happening thing, and our Protestant brothers and sisters are, you know, very quick to throw out that Easter bunny on Monday, but Easter's still going. It, it is. And one of my favorite things about the Easter season, believe it or not, is the fact that you get the book of Acts in the liturgy. We get Acts and Acts and Acts and Acts and Acts, and wow. I, I really like the book of Acts, so I'm kind of into that. Well, all right then. Yeah. Uh, speaking of uh, Easter, uh, and we actually touched on this a couple of days ago. This is from an anonymous listener. Greetings, gentlemen. Thank you for your program. Please give me an explanation on why Resurrection Sunday is called Easter. I need to explain this to my family. Thank you, anonymous. Yeah, thanks. I appreciate the question. So it's only called Easter in English. And most Christian countries use a word that is related to the Jewish word for Passover. All right. In French, for example, it would be Pâques, okay, which doesn't sound anything like Easter. Yeah. But in English-speaking countries, or in England, really, uh, the word Easter was used. Now, it, we don't really know why. We don't know where it came from. But there is some speculation that one source that we have from the Venerable Bede, who was a Saxon uh, writer, an old, you know, old English writer before modern English, who, who says that the word Easter was used because it named a month of the year. Uh, using Old English, where uh, th that the month was named after a pagan god, um, Esther, and but the, the the identification wasn't with the goddess; it was with the month of the year. Much the same way, like our month January, is named after the Roman god Janus. Mm. Now, if I you know if I say, "Hey, I'm going to meet you in January," that doesn't mean I'm secretly inviting you to offer sacrifices to the Roman god Janus. Right? I hope not. Right? Or you know, we talk. We just got finished with March. That's named for the Roman god Mars, right? The fact that we have these words in our calendar doesn't mean that we are pagans. It just means that we have inherited vocabulary from a previously pagan culture. Well, Christians have always done that. And apparently, um, old English Christians uh, use the, the month in which the celebration was held, uh, the month of Easter, that is to say, to name the holiday. So that, that's, a, that's a speculation about why that it, tradition exists in the English languages, but doesn't exist in other Catholic countries. Thank you so much for your question. Here's one, uh, kind of a sad one. This is from CB in New Orleans. Dr. Anders, my father is in his early 70s and suffers from depression and alcoholism. We have spoken to him as a family regarding his issues. We have invited him to church, have taken him to multiple doctors. He refuses help at every turn. What can I do to observe the fourth commandment of honoring my father if he doesn't want any help? Thanks, CB. Mm, yeah, good question, good question. Well, you know the old saying that's uh, it's kind of a uh, uh, it's kind of a cliche, but it's true. You can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. And you, if you have uh, been to meetings of uh, say um, Al-Anon, for example, they have the three C's. You you didn't cause it. Uh, you can't control it, and you can't cure it. It's the, the alcoholism is not your fault. It's not. It may be a problem for you, but you're not responsible for it. You shouldn't feel guilty about it. You can't control it, and you can't cure it. Um, this is on your dad. Now, obviously, you and I know that the depression and the alcoholism are intimately linked, and the the key to getting his mental health back is to first give up the alcohol. And uh, but, you know, to do that, he's got to recognize that he's got a problem and all this kind of thing. And if he doesn't want to comply, then um, you have to make a decision to not allow your father's self-destructive behavior to destroy your life. 
And I don't know your dad, and I don't know his personality, but it's often the case with addicts that they very much want their destructive behavior to destroy the lives of the people around them, or at least to become a tool that they can use to manipulate others through guilt. That's not doing justice to your dad or you. Mm. And so uh, you have, you're under no moral obligation to make yourself a doormat to further his own self-destructive tendencies. Mm. Wow, that's a tough one. ASCB, you are in our prayers. Thank you so much for your letter. Quick one here from another anonymous listener. At Bible study last month, someone claimed it is Catholic dogma that there are definitely people in hell. I have heard Dr. Andrews say that the church doesn't teach any specific person is in hell. So is it true that she also teaches hell has a non-zero population of damned souls? I know the church teaches that hell is a reality and that it's possible to go there, but I thought there was hope it will be empty in the end, uh, discounting the fallen angels, of course. Thanks, Anonymous. Okay, so um, there is a controversial aspect of this question, and there's a not controversial aspect of this question. Um, Here is the not controversial aspect. The church teaches the doctrine of hell. That's not controversial. Right. Um, here's Here's something else that's not controversial. The church has never officially proclaimed as a dogma that hell has a population. It exists, but it's never said how many people go there. Now, there are two opinions uh, uh, among theologians about the question of the size of hell's population. Um, there There is a school of thought that says, hey, Jesus said that the road is wide that leads to destruction and many find it, and the road is narrow that leads to life and few finds it. Find it seems to me like uh, hell's going to have a big population based on that similar text. Mm, yeah, um, and uh, you know there are descriptions of people in the next life weeping and gnashing their teeth and that sort of thing. So clearly somebody's going to fall into that camp. Uh, on that same line, uh, you know, Jesus's express words about Judas don't seem very encouraging. There is, however, another side of the story, and that is uh, uh, an expectation by the apostle that everybody will be reconciled through Christ and the prayer of the church that all people be saved and the expectation that God wants everybody to be saved. So how you balance those two is what theologians argue about. We'll be right back on... This is Doug Keck, President and Chief Operating Officer of the EWTN Global Catholic Network. Are you a new listener to EWTN Radio? Welcome. We're here for you 24-7. You know, on EWTN Radio, you'll hear live and interactive shows throughout the day to answer any questions you may have about the Catholic faith. There's trustworthy news from a Catholic perspective throughout the day and evening as well. We offer a large selection of podcasts from our well-respected hosts and partners available at EWTN's Podcast Central. And of course, the daily mass, prayers, and everything you need to edify your soul as you search for the truth. Welcome to EWTN Radio. We're blessed to have you with us. Hi, this is Father Mike Schmitz. Please join me for Ascension's Bible in a Year and Catechism in a Year here on EWTN Radio. We're going through the entire Bible and the Catechism in 365 days. If you've ever wanted to understand what it means to be Catholic and allow those truths to shape your life, this is for you. Bible in a Year and Catechism in a Year with Father Mike Schmitz, tonight at 10 p.m. Eastern, 7 p.m. Pacific on EWTN Radio. It's called a communion on this Friday afternoon here on EWTN. We are in the octave of Easter, and we're very glad uh, that you are with us, especially those of you who are brand new to the Catholic faith or uh, new listeners to EWTN. You know what? We are with you every step of the way. Please continue to listen to EWTN. I think you'll be edified each and every day. In a moment, we're going to get to the phones here at 833-288-EWTN. But first, let me tell you about something wonderful available right now at EWTN's Religious Catalog. You can enjoy your favorite hot beverage in your very own EWTN World Over mug. This sleek 13-ounce mug is blue. It's printed in bright white on the front and back 
with the official logo for The World Over with Raymond Arroyo. And it's both dishwasher and microwave safe. You can get yours now at the final clearance price of just $4.99. How about that? Available right now at EWTNRC.com. Buy Catholic, shop Catholic, EWTNRC.com. Toward the end of the show yesterday, we received a call from Patty in Hanover, Pennsylvania. We could not get her on, uh, but we asked her to please call us back. She did so, and glad to get you on today, Patty. A blessed Easter to you. What's on your mind today? Well, happy Easter to you, and thank you again for taking my call. Sure. I love your show. Um, so I'm calling to find out how you address a... Um, a young man, he's in his mid-20s, this is not a typical, raised Catholic, no longer practicing. One of the reasons he gave was um, too many rules. So um, I, I'm an avid listener, so as Dr. David Andrews would say, there's really just two rules, to love God and love your neighbor. His reply to that was, I don't need religion in order to do that. So where do we go from here? Yeah, do you remember that call yeah, from I the end of the, the day? Yeah. yeah, I do, okay. certainly, absolutely. So... You know, that's a great question, and I, one way to look at this is to examine the role that Christianity has played in human history in shaping what it meant to love. So, for example, if you were to look at um, uh, Greek and Roman philosophers on love, you would find a lot about um, erotic love, you would find a lot of reflection on, um, on the love of friendship— you would find some discussion of, say, paternal love. Um, interestingly, you, you don't you don't find a lot in pagan literature, especially not classical pagan literature, on the love of husbands and wives in the way that we would conceive of it today. And a, a good example of that would be in in Homer's epic, The Odyssey. Uh, you remember Odysseus is uh, is trapped on an island with um, I'm trying to think of her name. What's Calypso, right? Yeah, Calypso yeah. with Calypso. Yeah. And he's he's dying to go home, and uh, and you know modern romantics think well you know Odysseus wants to get back to his wife and children. Uh, problem with that interpretation, I learned this from C.S. Lewis by the way in his uh -huh. book on on uh, the allegory of love, is that uh, when when Odysseus finds out that he's going to get to leave Calypso's island and go home, he's all excited about it and he celebrates by going to bed with Calypso, which is not the way you would think somebody would act if they're no. what they're motivated by is the desire to go spend time with their wife. Now, what he wants is to get back to his patrimony. He wants his ancestral land. He wants his home. Uh. He wants his hunting dogs. You know, he wants his wife insofar as she's part of the accoutrements, right? Sure. But he doesn't dignify her with the love of sort of a uh, of, uh, of friendship that characterizes the Catholic un understanding of how it is that you are to love your spouse. And so in paganism, for example, it was commonly expected that women should be faithful to their husbands, but men, huh, they don't have to be faithful to their wives, you know, not at all. Totally different sexual ethic, totally different view of what it meant for a husband to love his wife. For Odysseus, it meant, you know, loving his wife the way he loved his favorite throw rug, perhaps. You know, it was, it was, she was part of the equipment that came along with the patrimony, mm -hmm. but not an equal partner, that sort of thing. Um, uh, the way that they loved children was different. So one of the things that Christianity objected to in paganism was the practice of abortion and the exposure of infants, especially infant girls. Uh, but of course, it was just it was just par for the course if you were in paganism that if you had an unwanted child, you just chucked that sucker out the window and got on with your business. Um, clearly, there was no mandate in paganism to love slaves. Uh, that was an absolutely unthinkable uh, uh, thing. And, and the way that uh, ancients treated their slaves, they could treat them very well and see that they got good educations and so forth because they might be used as pedagogues to help educate the children of the household. But if you weren't happy with them, you could torture them to death in horrible ways or rape them or whatever you wanted to do, and there was no recourse for the slave, no sense that the owner had any duty, certainly not, to love a slave. That would have been something that was deeply beneath him. And so the whole meaning of what, how love functioned in the ancient world, vastly different from what Christians understand. Of course, we now think of love, and, and this has penetrated Western consciousness, not just the Christian world, as uh, you know, the self-sacrificial love that really recognizes the dignity of the other, and in particular, the dignity of the marginalized and the poor. But that's a Christian gift. That's something that came into human consciousness 
through the gift of Christianity. Now, those of us who who live in the post-Christian West oftentimes take for granted some of these Christian ethics and don't realize that they weren't patently obvious to people before the advent of the Christian era. Interestingly, I was uh, I just this morning I was exposed. A friend of mine sent me a link to a video interviewing the famous atheist and religious critic Richard Dawkins. You know, the biologist oh, who, yeah, yeah. who has made hay by publishing the God Delusion and the Blind mm-hmm. Watchmaker. It really goes after religious fundamentalism in particular, and he made an absolutely astonishing admission in this interview. He said, uh, I consider myself to be, and I'm not making this up. I heard this straight from the mouth of Dawkins himself. He said, I consider myself to be a cultural Christian. Wow. He says, I'm not a believer. I don't actually think there's a God or anything like that. <clears throat> but I'm immensely grateful for the cultural world that Christianity brought into existence and the, the notion of human dignity and the way we treat women and uh-huh. our concepts of human rights and so forth. And he had a keen recognition that the cultures that had not been equally touched by Christianity did not share those values, and he clearly didn't want to live in one of them. He was grateful wow. for the Christian heritage of of Great Britain. He didn't want to see the cathedrals torn down or mm-hmm. the parishes rooted up or or the hymns or the or the or the mythology done away with because he saw that it had such a humanizing and decent effect on the nature of human consciousness. So there he stands at the one yard line. Uh, you know, sure, it's, it's sure. Like Right. I'm, I'm uh, not taking the ball I, in. I'll give you another example. Um, uh, another critic of Christianity, not a believer, doesn't believe in God, uh, doesn't believe in the inspiration of Scripture. I've mentioned him before on the show. Uh, the Scripture scholar Bart Ehrman, as I understand, is currently working on a book. His present book project is precisely on this question. It's the way that the ethics of Jesus radically transformed the way not just Christians, but but all civilization thought about questions of good and evil, thought about questions of human dignity, thought Uh about things like the care of one's neighbor. And so my point is, the idea that, that, that I can somehow just arrive at perfect love of God and neighbor on my own mm-hmm. without the benefit of a tradition, without the benefit of a community, um, well, historically, there's no basis for that conviction. The whole idea of loving neighbor as a kind of moral imperative is itself a Christian gift to the world. And it's not only the idea, but the ability to do it requires us to overcome some deeply seated, ingrained habits. One thing that I think is common to many religious traditions, not just Christianity, is the notion that living the moral life doesn't come easily, right? So go back to the pagans. Aristotle, for example, recognized that it wasn't just a matter of laying out what the moral imperatives were. You had to have a, a an upbringing, a pedagogy, a culture that instilled those things as habits, and uh, and and all of the recent scholarship that we see coming out in the popular literature, like James Clear's book, Atomic Habits, or Charles Duhigg's book on habits that was so popular 10 years ago, are all about this, that, that you know, 50, 60, 70 percent of our behavior consists, you know, not in our doctrines, but in our habits. It's those things that we put into practice on a daily basis that govern most of our activity. Well, habits are culturally transmitted, and that happens within the context of a community. Again, it's not something you can't you can arrive at on your own. You arrive at it from the value system of the people around you and the rituals that are instituted as part of your daily life. So mm-hmm. the, the, the idea that I can just be a perfect autodidact, that I can evolve my moral person and personality independent of influence is, uh, is ridiculously naive. Mm-hmm. And, and again, the, what the literature shows, the scientific <laughs> literature as well as the various wisdom traditions throughout the world, is that I'm not a real good judge of my own condition. Right. I mean, uh, when I studied Indian religions, uh, one of the first uh, seminar papers I wrote was on the guru tradition. Right. A totally different from, from tradition from Christianity yeah. that recognizes that people need someone outside of their own head to tell them what they're doing wrong. Mm, yeah. Right. You know, um, you'll find that. Uh, not just in Christianity, but in all kinds of traditions around the world, the need for a teacher, the need for someone to draw out of you the things that may be implicit that you yourselves can't quite get to, which is why part of the essence of wisdom is docility, the openness to being instructed by somebody else, mm-hmm. right? Not thinking that you have all, the, have all the answers. And it's easy to see when someone else comes mm-hmm. around and they present themselves as a know-it-all, and everybody else in the room can't stand to be around them because they're so obviously just a, a you know a big-headed blowhard, yeah. right? None of us value that sort of thing. But you need other people to bring that to your attention and help you understand that aspect of your own personality. So 
uh, all of us need the wisdom of a tradition. We need the balance of a community. We need the value systems. And we need those transformative rituals that can impart to us the moral habits that we ourselves are not going to evolve on our own steam. Now, I have no doubt that this young man uh, will have no trouble um, loving God and neighbor as he sees fit according to his definitions on his own. Yeah, he'll be exactly what he wants to be. But that may not be the person of virtue and heroism that uh, that he thinks. Is that helpful for you, Patty? Oh, absolutely. Thank you so much, Dr. David Anders and Tom, too. Thanks so much for your call, Patty, and uh, God bless you. That opens up a line for you right now at 833-288-EWTN. If you have a question for Dr. David Anders here on EWTN's Call to Communion, let's go now to Dan in Wisconsin, listening today on the EWTN app. Hey there, Dan. Happy Easter to you. What's on your mind today, sir? question for Dr. David Anders. Dan in Wisconsin, are you there? Let's go now to Dan. Dan has his radio up. I think that's the issue there. Dan, uh, can we can we try Dan one more time? Are you there, Dan? Dan in Wisconsin, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Okay, turn your radio down, Dan. Dan, has Dan. Oh. yeah, turn your radio all the way down, okay? Yes, I'm here. Go ahead. Okay, turn your radio down, Dan. Okay. You're on the air, Dan. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, doctor, you last week you said that Jesus ate his own body and blood. Uh, I don't understand that, and uh, as far as I know, Scripture says that he blessed it, broke it, and gave it to his disciples. So I don't see him eating his own body and blood, and I, and I don't understand why he would or why he would have to. Oh, okay, sure, 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 sure. You're right. So the scriptural account talks about Christ blessing the bread and distributing it. Um, But he also says, I won't drink of the fruit of this vine again until I drink it, you know, when I come in my father's kingdom. So there's an implication there that he's partaking in the in this uh, in this ritual. And he 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 also mentions that he does. He was desirous of celebrating this Passover with his disciples. And so since this is either a Passover meal or a kind of an anticipation of a Passover meal, the expectation is that everybody at the table would have been partaking so it seems reasonable to conclude, even though the text doesn't explicitly show us him, you know, placing a piece of bread in his own mouth. But whether whether he did or not, uh, the important thing about the doctrine of the real presence is that the consecrated host that was at table with them, uh, you know, Jesus held him his body in his own hands. That's the idea. The reason I made the point is simple, not the eating aspect so much as the reality of the presence, that mm. the, the real presence was there in the sacred host consecrated by Jesus on Holy Thursday. Dan, thanks so much for your call. Here is Stacy now in Illinois listening on Sirius XM Channel 130. Hello, Stacy. Happy Easter to you. What's on your mind today? Hi, Dr. Dan. Happy Easter. Thank you for taking my call. Hey, what can I do for you? Hi. So I have a quick question. So I am a cradle Catholic, and I grew up um, praying novenas with my family now and then, and just always understood them to be a very powerful way of asking for the intercession of a saint or Mary um, or Jesus. And I've got two fairly new friends that, um, I mean, fairly new Catholic friends who I was trying to explain to them. I wanted to consecrate my children to like blessed mother. And I was going to do so by saying a novena and, they are a little confused about a novena, so I was wondering if you could kind of go into the history of how a novena became this type of a prayer, and is it indeed a more powerful way of maybe making a request or saying a prayer? Yeah, sure. Okay. Absolutely. Thank you. So I, I want to draw a distinction at the outset, and that is between the origin of a practice and its justification. And they're not the same. They're not the same. You know, we can we can we can inherit a practice from our ancestors for you know some reason that has nothing to do with why we continue to observe it, right? Mm, yeah. Um, and uh, and I think that may be the case in the question of the novena. So there doesn't seem to have been a tradition of nine day prayer, particularly within uh, within the Old Testament or Judaism. And so the earliest Christians that took up the pattern of nine-day prayer may, in fact, have borrowed it from Roman morning customs. So there was a custom in 
Roman practice of mourning the dead for nine days, and that may have that may have entered into oh. uh, into Christian practice okay. because one thing that was Jewish and, and was Christian very early on was to was to commemorate the dead and particularly to venerate them at their tombs. That they did so for nine days may have been the fact that they were Latin speakers that were doing it. Mm-hmm. Okay, now um, we 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 can definitely see the practice from the fourth century. There's references to it in an early document called the Apostolic Constitutions. Now, when it comes to the justification as opposed to the origins, now we're going to move into a different territory right after the break. All right, uh, sit tight there, uh, Stacy. We'll get to you in a moment, and we'll continue this conversation. We'll also talk with Chris in Winston-Salem, John in Cincinnati. A couple lines open for you at 833-288-EWTN, 833-288-3986 for Call to Communion. The most original Catholic content is on EWTN Radio. Hey, this is Michael O'Neill, the Miracle Hunter. This week we talk with Chuck Neff about his film, The Holy Winding Sheet about the Shroud of Turin, and with historian Dan Cheely about the Sudarium of Oviedo. The Miracle Hunter with Michael O'Neill, tomorrow afternoon, 1 Eastern, on EWTN Radio. This is Father Agostino Torres with the Franciscan Friars of the Renewal. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Prayer for an end to abortion. Lord God, you have created every single human life with an infinite dignity. We pray, Lord, for the protection of the most vulnerable of us, those babies in the womb. We pray, Lord, that you may move the hearts of those who govern, move the hearts of those who provide medical care, move the hearts of those women and men who will have crisis pregnancies so that they may choose life and so that abortion may disappear in our times. We ask this through Christ our Lord. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. This is Deacon Jeff Drzezemski. The Catholic Cafe is a great destination for men to share experiences and strengthen their faith. Sunday morning, 1030 Eastern on EWTN Radio. 24-7 Catholic Radio, this is EWTN. Coming up Monday on More to Life, the life you were meant to live. We'll look at how the theology of the body can help you live a more abundant life. That's Monday on More to Life, 10 a.m. Eastern, 9 Central on EWTN Radio. Now back to Called to Communion with Dr. David Anders. It's called a communion with Dr. David Andrews here on this Friday afternoon of the Octave of Easter here on EWTN. Our phone number 833-288-EWTN. That's 833-288-3986. Before the break, we were talking with Stacy in Illinois regarding the novena. And uh, Dr. Andrews uh, began by talking about the history of the novena. And uh, part two is the uh, justification of the novena. Yeah, thanks. So the, the history may have come from Roman burial practices of mourning the dead for nine days. Mm-hmm. And since Christians also commemorated the dead, particularly venerated the saints at their tombs, the, the nine may have become attached in that way. Now, uh, later Christians, looking back on the practice and seeking to justify it, found some resonances within the New Testament. So sometimes it was aligned with um, the nine days in the upper room spent praying for the descent of the Holy Spirit, or the nine days between Pentecost and the Feast of the Ascension, or the nine months that Christ was in the womb, and other explanations like that have been proposed. The important thing, from my point of view, is that anything that you do, if it can become for you a kind of symbol to evoke something from the life of our Lord and to and to uh, provoke piety, is, is justifiable on that basis. Yeah. And so that brings us to the next part of the question, is that there is some kind of particular efficacy attached to a novena apart from any other form of prayer. And I would say yes and no. So first for the yes, uh, Jesus tells us in his parables about prayer that the it is the persevering prayer uh, for God's will to be done that will infallibly be answered. And think about the uh, the parable of the unjust judge who, who just wants to get a good night's sleep, and the widow, of course, is pounding on his door and saying, give me justice. And finally, he says, well, this woman's going to wear me out with her coming. I better do what, do what she says. And so the whole idea of persevering in prayer is definitely part of our Lord's teaching, and efficacy in prayer is linked to that perseverance. So 
I'd say anytime you've committed to pray for something, if you can commit to pray for it for a long time, you're more in keeping with the Lord's will. Now, uh, that's the yes part. On the no part, do I think that there's some kind of magical significance to the number nine? Like, let's say you pray for eight and a half days or for 11 days. Is that, have you somehow missed it? Well, no, I don't think so, and that would be that would be superstitious to make that kind of assumption. Prayer isn't magic. Um, the essence of magic, you know, is the idea that I can perform a ritual that will compel unseen powers to do my will. Um, Christian prayer takes an entirely different direction, which is that I'm seeking to uh, use ritual to evoke in me a change so that I become uh, conformed to God's will. So God, my will be done, is a very different disposition from uh, God, thy will be done. Christian prayer is thy will be done. Magic is my will be done. And so you will run into Catholics that will sometimes fall into superstitious tendencies, and they will imagine, well, you know, what I really want is to make an A on this test or get Sally to fall in love with me or, you know, to get a raise at work, and that's what I want, and so I'm going to jump through some hoops and make God do my will. And, of course, that's a superstitious way of praying. Sure. Stacy, thanks so much for your call today. It is called a communion here on EWTN. Hey, our friends in Cleveland need to hear from you next week. The great AM 1260 The Rock is going to be airing their spring pledge drive, and that starts up on Wednesday. So if you're listening in Cleveland or anywhere, remember to support your EWTN Catholic radio station. Back to the phones now for Chris in Winston-Salem watching us today on YouTube. Hey there, Chris. A uh, happy Easter to you. What's on your mind today, sir? Hello. Happy Easter. Thanks for taking my call. Sure. Um, My question is, I read an article online from a Catholic website, and it said that Mary, when she was at the foot of the cross, that she, along with Jesus, made satisfaction. And I'm confused about that. Yeah, sure. Thank you so much. I really appreciate the question. Well, that's, of course, true. Um, But before you, you know, go run screaming from the room with your hair on fire, let me explain that the Catholic faith teaches that all of us participate in the redemption of Christ, that Jesus is the supreme high priest, of course, and it's his sacrifice that merits for us the grace of redemption, but that our participation in the grace of Christ comes by way of our imitation of self-sacrifice. In fact, the, the very shape and, and, and color and meaning of Christian discipleship is to take up the cross and follow Jesus. That's what Christ says in Mark chapter 8, anybody who wants to be my disciple has to take up his cross and follow me. And in St. Paul's theology, that imitation of Christ unto suffering um, has a genuinely sacrificial character. And so in Romans chapter 12, Paul can say that your spiritual act of worship consists in the offering of yourself. That's the true spiritual worship and spirit and in truth that God will not despise. And he sees his own apostolic ministry in Romans chapter 15. His priestly duty is configuring Gentile converts precisely for this act of self-sacrifice. And, and the, the sacrifice of Christians themselves has a kind of redemptive and atoning value. So Paul can say in Colossians chapter 1, I fill up in my own flesh what's lacking in the sufferings of Christ for the sake of his body, the church, clearly indicating that the sufferings of Christians, um, in fact, can be meritorious, and that merit can be applied on behalf of others. Now, that is an Old Testament teaching as well. Think about the ending of the book of Job, when God says to Job's companions, I have absolutely no interest in your sacrifices. They are irreprehensible to me. However, if you get Job to pray for you and offer sacrifice, I'll listen to him, right? Now, is the Bible saying that we're saved through Job? Well, no, no we're <laughs> saved through Christ. But nevertheless, the, the pattern is the same, that Christ is the paradigm. He is the, he is the archetype for the life of redemptive suffering that is to characterize all of our lives. Now, the Blessed Virgin Mary is a member of the Church. She is saved by the grace of Christ as we are saved by the grace of Christ, but in a more super eminent way. Of course, she was preserved from original sin. That's how she was saved. But nevertheless, she still is a recipient of Christ's grace. Um, Like us, she participates in the redemption. Unlike us, she does so in a super eminent way. So her participation in the sacrifice of Christ is more perfect than ours, more meritorious than ours, but it is a difference in kind, a difference in degree, more than it is in a difference of, of, um, of quality. Whereas Jesus' sacrifice is unique because it's the source from which our lives of self-sacrifice derive. 
Chris, thanks so much for your call today. Call to communion on this Friday afternoon here on EWTN. Let's go to Cincinnati now and talk with John, listening to us on the great Sacred Heart Radio AM 740. Hey there, John. Happy Easter to you. What's on your mind today, sir? Good afternoon. I kind of have a minor, uh, uh, I'm a revert, and I have a minor lingering kind of question from my uh, childhood that the nuns couldn't answer 50 years ago, so... I'll give Dr. Andrews a shot here. Uh, at Mass, we say, uh, Lord, I'm not worthy to receive you. Only uh, say the word and I shall be healed. Uh, immediately before we do go, receive him in communion. And as a kid, that always struck me as being uh, incongruous or, or conflicting or, or whatever. And and so maybe you can help me understand the rationale for saying I'm not worthy to receive them and then seeming to feel like I'm worthy to receive him by going to communion. Yeah, thanks. So uh, Catholic theology, as usual, kind of splits the difference in this dichotomy, and it'll say there is a manner in which we can consider ourselves unworthy, and there's a manner in which we can consider ourselves worthy. So we're worthy insofar as we're made sons and daughters of Christ through baptism and the grace of Christ. And so we participate in that sonship of Jesus, and, uh, and we're elevated as sons and, and daughters. And, and so we stand in a relationship to God that enables us to come and offer him true worship and praise. But it's predicated on an attitude of humility that recognizes that we're poor sinners who have nothing of ourselves and that everything that we have that's good comes from God. And that uh, if there's any merit or goodness in us, it's only in there because of a gift. And so you can, the, the, the proper, think of the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. And the Pharisee says, I thank thee, God, that I'm not like that tax collector. Here's a guy who thinks that his right standing with God is a matter of his own inherent righteousness, something that he does on his own without God's help. Over here is the tax collector who says, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Christ says it's the latter that goes home justified rather than the former. So we do have a righteousness that Christ imparts to us, but it comes in conjunction with our act of contrition, faith, and humility that recognizes that at the end of the day, we're poor sinners who stand in need of grace. So the grace that makes us worthy is the grace that works in us through this uh, contrition and recognition of our own unworthiness. Uh, St. Francis of Assisi, who's often regarded as, uh, you know, maybe the closest thing after Mary to the, to the likeness of Christ in Catholic history, um, you know, he he was he was extreme in his self abnegation, and his uh, and his uh, and his humility in his declarations of his worthlessness. Appreciate your call, John, and uh, glad that you're listening there in Cincinnati. Let's go over the o- other side of the Ohio River and talk with Melissa in Highland Heights, Kentucky, also listening on the Great Sacred Heart Radio. Hello, Melissa. What's on your mind today? Hi. Thank you so much for taking my call. I love your show. Thank you. I am a new Catholic. I started the RCIA process in August of 2023 and just received my first communion at the Easter Vigil. And um, I'm just so in awe over everything and just so thankful. But I do have a question about um, sort of the history of how, like from the Last Supper to now how the priest consecrates the host and the chalice and that becomes the body and blood of Christ. I was just more of the just the the history of it. Like is that in the Bible or is that some Oh yeah. Tradition? Oh yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So uh, in in the New Testament, most scholars believe that the earliest texts of the New Testament are actually the letters of Paul. Uh, 1 Thessalonians is often thought to be the first letter that was actually composed. Um, and the and so the first, on that theory, the first account of the Last Supper that we have from a literary point of view is St. Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. And if you will start at chapter 10 and read forward, 10 and 11 in particular, you get, a, you get an account of the Lord's Supper um, that Paul claims that he received from tradition. So what he says is the tradition that I receive from the Lord I hand on to you, namely that on the night he was betrayed, he took bread and broke it and said, this is my body, etc. So Paul's letter is the earliest literary account, but he's, but he's referencing something that is already known to, to the Corinthians from an antecedent oral tradition. And, uh, and in fact, that is the tradition of celebrating the Eucharist as the memorial of Christ's death. Um, so, and he talks about the reality of the real presence. He says, you know, if you sin against this, you sin against the body and blood of the Lord. And 
you, you can't come and partake of it in an unworthy manner and so forth. And through this, we all become members of the one body of Christ, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So go take a look at that text. Um, the Gospel writers are actually later than St. Paul, and they show a tremendous amount of overlap with Paul's account. Um, and they, they discuss the Eucharist as the, uh, as the rite of the new covenant in Christ's blood. For example, you find that in Luke's account explicitly. All of them see it as the memorial of Christ's death and the sacrifice of the new covenant. Um, and, of course, the words of institution we find right there in the account of the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. This is my body. This is the blood of the new covenant given for you, and so forth. So, um, so the first the oral tradition, then the writings of Paul, then the Synoptic Gospels. And there's, a, of course, just perfect consistency in Catholic tradition from that point forward. So uh, I think the next, uh, one of the next places in history you find a detailed account of the ritual is in, uh, well, not a detailed account of the ritual, but of its theology would be in the letters of Ignatius of Antioch, who was the second bishop in Antioch after St. Peter, and he makes belief in the real presence to be the sine qua non of Catholic orthodoxy, that people who don't believe in that also don't believe in the Incarnation, and so you have to hold to the real presence of Christ and be in communion with the bishop who stands in apostolic succession to the apostles right there in the beginning of the second century in Antioch. Um, the first sort of lengthy discussion we have of the Eucharist in, in ancient history outside the New Testament is from uh, a, a work called The First Apology of Justin Martyr, who died in around the year 165. So, you know, mid-2nd century, he gives a detailed discussion of early Christian worship in which the elements of the Eucharist are clearly set forth. And he says, and we don't regard these as ordinary bread and wine, but as the flesh and blood of our Savior Jesus Christ. And, and I could just go through and cite text after text from the 2nd century forward uh, discussing the realism of Christ's presence in the Holy Eucharist. And as you may be aware, even the earliest Protestants, uh, like Martin Luther, for example, vehemently defended the doctrine of Christ's real presence in the Eucharist, though Luther differed with Catholics on other things. That was not one of them. Um, John Calvin, who had a different view from Luther, also a Protestant theologian, nevertheless confessed that in the Eucharist we have a true and substantial partaking in the body and blood of our Lord. That's his language from Book 3 of Calvin's Institutes. So um, consistent Christian teaching from, of course, even before the writing of the New Testament, all the way up into the beginnings of even the Protestant era, on the reality of Christ's presence in the consecrated bread and wine, the memorial of his death and resurrection. Melissa, thank you so much for your call, and welcome home to the Catholic faith. We are very glad to have you with us here on EWTN. Hey, this weekend, be sure to join us for Vatican Insider. That's coming up Saturday, 5 a.m. Eastern, Saturday night at 9.30 p.m. Eastern. This weekend, Joan Lewis discusses part two of her special, Who is the Man of the Shroud? Oh, very timely. Do check it out this weekend only on EWTN Radio. Going now to Sherry in Oklahoma, listening online. EWTN.com. Hey there, Sherry. Happy Easter to you. What's on your mind today? Thank you for taking my call. Sure. Um, during some confusing years in my life away from the Mass and the Catholic Church, I allowed myself to be rebaptized in two different Protestant denominations. And I've come to realize um, in my journey back to the Catholic Church, I've come to realize that both of them were invalid. And in one circumstance, I believe the pastor even used the improper wording of saying, we baptize you. So um, I, in my journey back to the church, I gave a devoted effort to follow the steps necessary for true reconciliation under the guidance of the Catholic faith, and EWTN was very instrumental in helping me understand that process. And I've done a lot of reading and studying and praying, and, and uh, but I realized that it had to begin with the sacrament of reconciliation. But my question is, um, is it necessary for me to inform these two Protestant churches through a cordial letter that I am and have always been a Catholic Christian? Yeah, I appreciate the question. So, first of all, you've done everything that you need to do. You've been to confession. You've been reconciled to the Church. Um so uh, I, I would not hold personally, and I don't think there's any church document to the contrary, that you have any obligation to these Protestant congregations other than to stop receiving their sacraments, mm, right? Yeah. Um, 
And uh, and quite honestly, if you wrote such a letter, they wouldn't have any idea what to do with it, and they probably <laughs> wouldn't care, right? I mean, it's not going to change their behavior yeah. at all. Um, and uh, and you don't need. You've already renounced your affiliation to the only in the only forum in which you are required to renounce it, and that is before Christ's Church, because from the Catholic point of view, they're not churches. They don't have any jurisdiction that you need to recognize, right? And so you've already renounced that putative jurisdiction over you by going to confession. You, you don't need to go renounce it to them, too. Sure. Sherry, thanks so much for your call. Welcome home. Glad to have you back here with us. It is uh, Michael now in Atlanta. Michael is listening, uh, let's see here, click uh, on Sirius XM Channel 130. Hey there, Michael. Happy Easter to you. What's on your mind today, sir? Happy Easter to you guys as well, and thank you for taking my call. Sure. The question the question I have, or maybe it's a two-part question, is related to, uh, the, I guess, the deity of Christ, and this was, came as a result of having a discussion with a Muslim colleague of mine, and we were discussing Jesus, and he was, you know, telling me that in their eyes he's, he's a prophet, that he's not God, and that there's only one God, and, you know, how can he be God, and, and if he was, you know, why did he come, why did he come to the earth as, you know, as, as a man, and then who was he praying to when he was praying, and why would God need to, need to pray, I guess? And then the other sort of part of the question related to how he spoke to his mother, to Mary, at the wedding, um, I guess it was explained kind of that he spoke to her, most maybe rebuked her or talked to her kind of in a rude manner, and he would just question that as like the dignity of why would God talk to, you know, his mother, you know, and a female like that. So I was just kind of looking for a better explanation of yeah, you sure. Know, let me why? let me deal with the first question first because it's by far the more significant because it goes right to the heart of the difference between Islam and Catholicism, namely the doctrine of the Trinity, the Incarnation. So, first of all, as to the question, why would Jesus need to pray if he were God because he would just be talking to himself? The here the Muslim makes the mistake of not recognizing that within the Catholic doctrine of God we hold there to be a real distinction between the Father and the Son. The doctrine of the Trinity means that there are three persons in the Godhead. And uh, so the only distinction that we can draw about the Godhead, everything else is we, have, we acknowledge total unity, unity of essence, is that there is a distinction of relation. And so paternity and filiation are of the essence of the Godhead. And that means that there is communion. Now, one doesn't commune with oneself, except in a mere metaphor, Right. Uh, communion is a sharing between persons, and that is that is integral to the nature of the Blessed Trinity. And so uh, that's true even before the Incarnation. God is eternally triune in that respect. The And that, that's important for us to know, right, because it suggests that communitarian relationship is not just morally preeminent, but it's metaphysically preeminent, that ontologically, in the very nature of the construction of the universe itself— that communitarian relation is absolutely essential, okay? And so when we, when we seek to imitate God, love as a Christian ethic is really grounded fundamentally in the nature of reality itself. Uh, as an aside, wonderful book on that specific topic is St. Bonaventure's classic of spirituality, The Mind's Journey into God, in which he takes the pattern of Trinitarian relations as being sort of the paradigm for understanding the cosmos, right? So absolutely essential. Now, uh, the question as to why the, the why Christ would have to become a man, well, the classic Catholic answer to this question, of course, is so that he can redeem humanity, that he can heal humanity, that he can cure humanity by entering into solidarity with us, right? And uh, this is an idea, I think, that is foreign to Islam, which typically, if I understand it, typically views the human condition as one of subjugation and obedience in relationship to God only. Um, but, of course, in the Catholic scheme of things, God is motivated by love of humanity, not just domination of humanity. Mm -hmm. And it is of the nature of love to humble itself and come alongside, right? Mm -hmm. And, uh, I mean, think about the difference between the tyrannical father who stands over his child and says, you will do the algebra homework or I will beat you, and the father that says, you know, let me come down and sit on the bench next to you and really enter into this frustration that you're experiencing and, mm, and, yeah. and love alongside you as we figure out this thing together. Right? That, that 
that coming alongside, that accompaniment, that is the means whereby God transforms human personality from self-destructive and self-deceptive tendencies into that opening and flowering of the personality that we call sanctification, that is why Christ became incarnate. He literally becomes human so he can heal humanity from the inside out, becoming the means and the example and the paradigm of our own of our own transformation. Now, since prayer to the Father, communion with the Father, is already part of the divine personality, um, by taking on human flesh, he, he, he opens to us the possibility of participating in his filial relationship with God. So this is no longer the side of God's sort of internal economy. I'm now talking about the nature of redemption, something else that's very different from Islam. Uh, Muslims do not consider God our Father, and we are not children of God in their theology. In fact, they consider that language to be blasphemous. We're more like God's pets. We're like his golden retrievers or his goldfish that he can do with as he wants. But the Christian view is that God elevates us to the status of sons. We have that kind of intimacy, and we have it in and through our union with the God-man. And so the relations, the filial relationship that Jesus has with his father predates the incarnation, but it becomes incarnate, and so it becomes the filial relationship of a human being, the paradigm of our own filial relationship, whereby and wherein we can refer to God as Father or Abba. Um, now, the question about Jesus' response to his mother, I think the text doesn't say anything about Jesus being disrespectful. All right, I think that the reader who, who interprets that is hearing a tone of voice in the text when they read it in their own mind that isn't on the page. I mean, there's nothing in the text that suggests that Jesus used a harsh voice um, or that he said it in a demeaning fashion. I mean, literally what he says is, what to thee and to me? And, and just imagine the way an actor can take a script and make the same words mean something vastly different sure. from actor to actor, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Depending on how they emphasize it. And, and run through your mind all the possible ways that Christ might have said that with humor, with irony, with, with deference. Uh, think about the ways he could have said it. She comes and says, they have no more wine. Now, the miracle itself is highly indicative because what he does is he takes the ceremonial washing jars of Old Covenant ritual and transforms them so that they become symbols of the new life that, are, that is in Jesus. And so the way I understand this is Christ takes what is a mundane question about a matter of the wedding, and he says, okay, so what, okay, you, Mary, Mom, you and I both know what my divine mission is here. I'm here to redeem the world. Now let's take this as a teaching moment. You've asked me a question about wine. What what does this have to do with the question of redemption? Mm. I'm going to show you. I'm going to let your question about wedding guests become a symbol of redemption in the new covenant. And Mary's like, yeah, man, do what he says. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's that that's the stuff. Now you're talking, yeah. son. You know, and then at the end of the gospel, he turns to John <laughs> and he says, behold your mother. Woman, behold your son. And so I didn't even talk about the connection to Genesis 3 and Revelation 12 and the symbolism that connects Mary to Eve and where she emerges from this story is the second Eve, which, of course, is a glorious uh, uh, depiction and identity for her. So no need to read this as some kind of condescension to Mary. Michael, thank you so much for your call. Dr. David Andrews, have a great weekend. Thank you, Tom. We hope everybody has a great weekend. Be sure to check out our special Divine Mercy programming on Sunday. We'll see you again on Monday right here on EWTN. On behalf of our great team, I'm Tom Price. We will see you then. Have a great day and God bless. One of the reasons we should go to Mass is because, if you look in the Catechism, you will see the fruits of Holy Communion. And these are remarkable.